Oh, gracious and loving God, a God who will silence the minds of this world. We ask that you bless our time of worship today and instill your spirit in our hearts each and every day. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart in this room be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I remember when I was in school, though it's been a few years since I was a child, but there was when we got back from summer vacation every year, there was always this writing assignment. I'm sure many of you had a very similar experience. Now in hindsight, and the more I've learned about teachers and teaching over the course of my life, I realized it was probably an attempt by our teachers to kind of figure out, to gauge where we were in our education so he or she knew where to begin our lessons. But the annual task itself was usually easy enough. And I specifically recall that on more than one year, the assignment was usually called something like, What I Learned on Summer Vacation. It was always, I always really enjoyed those. And as we did this, the teacher was learning something about us, but it gave us, the, the students, everyone writing this, it gave us an opportunity to reflect, to look back on some of the more exciting parts of our time away from school. Now, in, role, in, in the role of pastor, as your pastor of, of, of this church, I'm also your teacher. Now, for me, this is the responsibility that I most enjoy and that I take most seriously. Through prayer, you have entrusted me to spend time each and every week in prayer and to try to discern where our God is calling us, where our still-speaking God is calling us to move forward what our God is calling this community into. And even as we can look back and think on our vacations as a time of rest, I think there's also a lot that we can learn from our time of vacation. So today I want to share with you what I learned on my summer vacation. But before we get into that, I want us to look at our scripture lesson for today. Daniel is a Jewish exile from Jerusalem. Now, the name Daniel in Hebrew means God is my judge. Hold on to that little tidbit because we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Now, Daniel, as we told the children, is greatly respected in the king's court. He has worked his way up to becoming one of the king's most trusted advisors, even though he is very far from home and is an outsider in their land. He oversees hundreds of other officials. And Daniel is on the verge of getting a promotion to the number two spot in the empire. He'll be right behind the king. But there are other court officials who are jealous of Daniel because they see him as an outsider, as someone who doesn't belong there. So they devise a plan to have Daniel murdered. They manipulate the king into passing a law that says worship, there can be no worship of any god any divinity, or any person except for the king for 30 days in a row. Now, of course, Daniel, being very faithful to God, he spent time in his house every single day, three times a day. The text tells us morning, noon, and night offering prayers to God. Because Daniel believed that God was his guide. Daniel, of course, was aware of this new law, but he chose to keep up his routine anyway. So these officials, they got the king to pass this new law. They went to Daniel's house in the kitchen praying. Of course, they have him punished for breaking the new law by having him thrown into a pit or to a den of lions. The king frets and worries all night until we find out the next morning that an angel from God has come down and kept it lions at bay, and Daniel, of course, is safe. So in essence, we have a man refusing to give up his faith in spite of an unjust law. And we know that centuries later, Christ teaches that we should give to Caesar 
the things that belong to Caesar and give to God the things that belong to God. I think one thing this story is trying to teach us is that our worship belongs to God. Not to our kings, not to our leaders, and not to our country. Daniel took every single day, just a few minutes, morning, noon, and night, to spend time in prayer. But this was more than his worship of God. This story teaches us the importance of taking time away to be with God. It teaches us the importance of taking time to care for our own selves. Now, how many of us here have a smartphone? Okay, raise them high. I know there's more than that. There we go. Now, how many of you have your work email linked to your phone? Yeah, but raise your hand. I know you do. <laughs> now, I know many of us in this room and in this world have very important positions that we think require our constant attention. But in doing that, does that leave any time for our own lives? Does being constantly connected allow any time for personal rest? Would the world really stop turning if we took the day off? I think you know how I would answer these questions, but I'll talk a little more before I do. <laughs> now, in a recent study, it was discovered that taking vacation time has benefits to our physical health, to our physical health, and to our emotional health. And I don't necessarily mean going to Europe or, you know, taking a week to go to Niagara Falls. Just the simple act of taking a break, taking time away from our jobs, provides us with health benefits, benefits to our physical bodies. Now, that same study also found that people who take time away are actually more likely to live a longer life. Hmm. Now, it is actually proven that vacation helps to prevent burnout. It makes us more productive. It makes us more creative. And God teaches us about taking time away from our hectic schedules, from the very beginning of our scripture. We've talked about this before, and we will talk about it again, I'm sure, but I always think this is a lesson that deserves repeating. Taking care of ourselves is very important, my friend. Regular self-care includes taking time away from our busy, hectic jobs. Now, God teaches us that it is good for our souls. But now with this incredible mind and science that God has endowed for us to pursue, we now know that it is good for our physical bodies as well. United Church of Christ theologian Walter Brueggemann has written that keeping a time of rest is not about worshiping God. In the first instance, it is about stopping work. It is about withdrawal from the anxiety system of Pharaoh. The refusal to let one's life be defined by production and consumption and the endless pursuit of private well-being. I love Walter Brueggemann, but he's not always the most succinct person. So in other words, what he's trying to say is taking time away from ourselves to spend time with God and with our family and friends is about removing ourselves from the daily activities. Is about removing ourselves from the daily activities that can cause us stress. Taking vacation is about defining ourselves as individuals created in the image of our God. We are not defined by what we do, the tasks that we set ourselves to. We are defined by who we are as children of God, as beings created in the image of our God. That's who we are. Taking time away from our busy schedules, taking time to reflect on God's movement in our lives, taking time for personal rest and rejuvenation allows us to put our lives and our calling into perspective. It allows us the needed space to remind us that first and foremost, we are children of God. And that, my friends, is what I learned on my Sunday vacation. That we all need to take the time out to care for ourselves, to be rejuvenated, so that we can go forth with strength and creativity. We need to take the time to, on occasion, to step away. 
I know personally that I am the better for it. And Daniel has something to say about this as well, I believe. Daniel was not defined by being the king's advisor. Daniel's identity was not as a member of the king's court. Daniel was defined by his faith in God, his relationship with God. And when he chose to break the law of the king, he did so knowing that being a child of God was his number one priority. He believed that in order to maintain his relationship with God, he had to be very intentional about spending time away, spending time away, to take time to spend with God. Now, in our day, in our culture, in 2018, Cleveland, Ohio, we don't usually have to make that choice. And even as we can look with different statistics, we know that membership in many U.S. churches has been in decline for decades. And we, like I said, are not forced to choose between our faith and something else. We have that freedom in this country. But even with that freedom, that is a choice that we actually often make. We choose to answer emails from work on our day off. We choose to do all the errands we couldn't get done during the week on our day of Sabbath. We choose to keep our minds racing and thinking and often leave God out of the process. Now, some of you, of course, I know have very important jobs. So surely I'm not talking to you, right? My pastor doesn't really want me to step back from my high-powered position, my really important job, and actually take a whole day off, does he? Well, of course I do. I care about each of you, and God loves each of you so very much, my friends. As simplistic as it might sound, God knows what is best for us. And God teaches us that on occasion we need to step back and take time for ourselves. What good can we be to others if we are not fully refreshed for the tasks that lay ahead of us? Now taking time away is something that pastors are usually very bad at doing. Like many of you here today, I often find myself working on my day off. But I think we can all do better. We can all do better. Our time away should be about spending time with God. But it's also about spending time away from the world. Daniel withdrew from his courtly duties three times every single day to spend time in prayer. I think this is something we can learn a lot from. Now, I had mentioned earlier that Daniel, the name Daniel means God is my judge. And Daniel is judged by God. On his faithfulness, not on his failure to live up to this human law. And of course, for Daniel's defiance of the king's command, he is thrown into this pit, into this den of lions. And if we think of that mighty roar, those formidable animals, when our children roar, you can imagine how loud that must have been, how distracting, how scared, how frightened Daniel must have been. But God shut the mouths of these lions. God quieted their roars. God shut the dangers of the world out because Daniel's unwavering faith in God. Now I submit that wouldn't the God who has promised us, all of us, so much, the God that we seek to faithfully serve and worship, do the same for each of us? God will silence the lions of this world but we need to be real, willing to rely on God to do that for us. Now, relationships of all kinds take work. Many of us are married or have children or have other close relationships with people in our lives. These relationships take intentionality and ongoing work to stay healthy. And, of course, our relationship with God is no different. It is just like this. God is doing God's part in this relationship. So we need to continue to do our own work as well. And taking time away for, to refresh and rejuvenate our own souls and our own spirits is one way we can live into this call. I'm sure we've all heard that old saying, I work hard and I play hard. I've always liked that, but 
never really found it quite true for me. So I want to adapt it for myself and say, I work hard and I rest hard. <coughs> so as your pastor, the best way I know to teach you the importance of self-care is to model this behavior. I pray that all of us in this church and in this world can take time out for ourselves when needed. Because in taking time for ourselves, we can live more fully into the servants that our God has created us to be. May it be so, my friends. I invite you to the singing of our next hymn. It's in your black hymnal, number 195, The Old Rugged Cross. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as you are able. <clears throat>